Here's an interesting problem about efficient integers. The problem states, so let k equal to 2020, and it asks, find the largest possible product of integers which sum to give k. So let's maybe test some numbers on a smaller example. So something, instead of something like 2020, let's try a smaller number. So I'm gonna pick something like, uh, something small like 12. And let's see how, um, how the integers behave around 12. So we could leave it as is, as one group, and that is the product just by itself as n equals 12. Or we could kind of break it up into two groups. Um, so we could try like two groups of six, for example. So I'm gonna label the product as x, and so we have, I'll call the first one x1 equal to six, x2 is equal to six, so our total x, which is the product of all our integers, in this case is 36, right? So in this case, it's obviously larger. And what about then, okay, so it seems like increasing the groups tends to do better. Can we extend this idea? What about three groups? So three even groups from 12 now is uh, four. So x1 is equal to four, x2 is equal to four, and x3 is equal to four, right? And so now our total product x again, in this case is four cubed, which is equal to, in this case, it's 64. Hmm. Okay, so we do notice something. It seems like increasing the number of groups, at least from one to two, definitely from one to two, and at least from two to three, for our small case, n equals 12. It seems like this is um, kind of producing more efficient integers in terms of the, um, product that you form by keeping the sum the same seems to increase. And we'll do one more actually, let's try one more. So if we, if we broke this into, into, into four groups now, so four groups, equal groups, and I haven't really explained why they must be equal, or even if they should be equal, but we're just messing around here. So let's see, let's see uh, four groups. What does that look like? So from n equals 12 into four groups, we have obviously breaks into three. So x1 is equal to three x2 is equal to 3, x3 is equal to 3, and x4 is equal to 3, right? So I get the total is, I mean, 3 to the power of 4, right? Which is 9 times 3 to 27, which is 81. Hmm, and it does seem to increase. So something strange. So, yeah, it seems like increasing the groups tends to do better. But the question is, this is, always, is this always the case? Is increasing the groups always the best thing to do? Or is there some kind of turning point eventually that we'll reach? Or, um, yeah, what is the best number? Cool. Okay, so here's, a, here's an idea, here's a proof. Yeah. Yeah, I am mid tape. Oh, is there Oh, yeah, there's a cut. Here's the cut. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good, yeah. So here's an idea um, that shows why some numbers are necessarily better than others. So let's take, for example, let's take a number that we want to try and see how efficient this number is in terms of whether or not it can give a product which is large. So let's call this number, let's call this number, well, I'll use the same notation I was just using previously. Let's call this number xk. Now, let's assume xk is even. So assume xk is e even. Even, right? So if xk is even, we can always divide it into two. So I don't want to say this. So assume xk is even. What we can do is like, if we take xk and divide it down the middle, divide into halves, right? So we can divide into two groups that'll sum to xk. And those, those two numbers, even numbers, will be xk on two plus xk on two, right? And we want to check if their product is greater than xk by itself. So that's simply just xk on two squared, which is equal to xk squared on 4. And I want to know for what values of xk, or are there any values for xk, which this is always greater than the original xk that I had before. Right? And I simply divide both sides and I multiply across. So this directly implies, if my product, by dividing the number in 2, and then multiplying it together, is greater than the original, this implies directly that xk must be greater than or equal to 4. Right? 
So immediately we get this idea. So, so whatever integers we choose, it is always more, more efficient to divide that number into two and multiply those two numbers together to obtain a product than it is to use the original number, given that it's even, if that number is greater than or equal to four, right? So for essentially what I've proven here is that for any xk greater than or equal to four, it is always better. It is always better to use xk on two times itself squared. Cool. Yeah. So is this the same for xk is odd? Kind of intuitively, it must be right because there's no difference between how. Um, integers behave or how they increase in, in product and sum between I even and odds but because I can't just divide xk on 2 if it's odd and obtain an integer I have to do a quick change to this proof so now we assume xk is odd odd right I can't just go xk on 2 plus xk on 2 I have to go xk on 2 plus 0 0.5 to obtain an integer, and I have to go xk on 2 minus 0 0.5 to obtain an integer again. I'm going to continue this proof on a new page. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so I'm going to continue the proof. So now we assume it's odd, and we try this breakdown. We try dividing by 2, but since it's odd, and we divide by 2, we don't actually obtain an, um, two integers, so we have to add half and subtract half. And we want to check if this product, or for what values of xk is this product greater than the original, xk. We can simplify this left-hand side. It's really just xk on 2. You notice it's a plus b, a minus b. So it's xk on 2 squared minus 0 0.5 squared is greater than or equal to xk. And so we get something similar. xk squared on 4 minus xk minus 0 0.5 squared greater than or equal to 0. I actually don't want to move that to the other side, so I'm going to move it back real quick, but I'm going to multiply everything by 4. So we get xk squared minus, uh, sorry, greater than or equal to, and we have 4xk plus 1. So we notice when xk is equal to 3, this inequality doesn't hold because the left-hand side is 9 and the right-hand side, so that's the left-hand side, and the right-hand side is 12 plus 1 is equal to 13. But when xk is greater than or equal to 4, so in this case, when xk is equal to 4, we get the exact same thing with even numbers. So this inequality will always hold for xk greater than or equal to 4 because the left-hand side is quadratic, so it'll increase at a faster rate than the right-hand side will. And I found, I'll show you, I found the boundary condition of xk is equal to four. So I get 16 is greater than or equal to 16 plus one. So it must be at least, sorry. So that's, yeah, so it must be at least xk is equal to five for our first odd number. So if we check the left-hand side, we get 25 is greater than or equal to 20 plus one. And so this is true for not only five, five is the first number it's true for, but since the left-hand side is quadratic, it'll always increase at a faster rate than the right-hand side. So if it's true for xk is equal to five, it's true for any odd number greater than five. So essentially what I've done therefore is proven that for our efficient integer, I've restricted it to the subspace of all xk less than or equal to four. So in fact, I've proven it for all xk less than four because from my even number proof, you can use this strictly greater than inequality. And so our numbers must be xk's, they must be in the set one, two, or three. Cool. Cool, so I've proven that xk, whatever we, however we wanna break up the, um, our final n into whatever integers we must use, it's always optimal to use either one, two, or three from my proofs above. It's always suboptimal to use 
a number greater than or equal to four because we can always, regardless if it's even or odd, we can always use essentially the two numbers in the middle that sum up to that number and multiply them together and they'll always give us a greater product. Now between these three numbers though, which one is actually the most efficient? Obviously from inspection, we can immediately eliminate one, right? Because one doesn't generate a product that increases anything by itself. So one is actually the least efficient. So the question just is, is two the most efficient integer or is three? Now intuitively from our um, previous examples that we did with n is equal to 12, you might assume that it must be two. Because in the case where we had just one group, when we had x1 is equal to 12, that's the least efficient. And when we had two groups where we had x1 is equal to six and x2 is equal to six, we managed to obtain a greater product equal to 36. And when we had x1 is equal to four, when we had three groups and x2 is equal to four and x3 is equal to four, we obtained an even larger product. X is equal to 64 in this case. And so the, intuitively you might think the pattern increases just by this, the number of groups increases. Somehow like the exponentiation, the trade-off between exponentiation and the decrease in the base kind of always outweighs the decrease in the base. But is this the case? Or is this really how it works? And the answer is actually no. And if you look at it, look at why. So for example, let's try it. Let's try with our example, setting all the bases to be equal to three versus all the bases to be equal to two. So in the case where all the bases are equal to three, we get four bases. So we get x1 is equal to three, x2 is equal to three, x3 is equal to three, and x4 is equal to three. Right, our total sum is, I've done this before, three to the power of four, which was equal to 81, right? And in the case where they're all equal to two, x1 is equal to two, we get two extra powers, right? Because two goes into 12 six times, x3 is equal to two, x4 is equal to two. Uh, I'm gonna speed this up a bit, x6 is equal to two, right? In this case, we get x is equal to two to the power of six, right? To the power of five is 32, so two out of six is 64. In fact, you could have just done four to the power of three, which we did last time, which was also 64. Yeah, so actually it doesn't actually increase. For some reason, and it works for most numbers, and I'll show you, uh, it, sorry, it works for all numbers and it doesn't have to be 12. But for some reason, three is the most efficient integer in this case. And you can kind of intuitively understand that immediately because whenever you have, um, whenever you have n is equal to six, or whenever you have a, a, a sum of six that you can take away from your n, you can either, if you were to turn that into threes or twos, you notice that you can go three twos, which is two times two times two, which is eight, or you can go two threes, which is nine. So threes for some reason, I mean, this is, this is a more uh, straightforward way to see, but for some reason three is the most efficient integer. Now, why is this the case? And I'll, I'll explain it in my, um, I'll explain it on a new page. Yeah. So why is three more efficient than two in these cases where it seems to be like increasing the number of groups or increasing the, the number that you're exponentiating by kind of always seems, it seemed to have outweighed decreasing the base. But for some reason, once you get to three, decreasing the base there from three to two doesn't seem to do as well as increasing the exponentiation. And so that has a lot to do with what you're actually trying to graph. What function are you actually trying to solve for? And what function are you actually trying to find the maximum of? And so I've written it here. So in this case, what you're actually doing is when you're taking a number and you're dividing it into even groups and then multiplying them all together, essentially what you're doing is grabbing that n. So for example, in our case, n was 12. You're dividing it by what number you want the base to be. So in this case, it'd be either three or two or two. And then you're multiplying it that many times in the base. So that's where you get this function x to the power of n of x. And if we want to find out what number, not integer, but just what number this is the most efficient for, we just do it like we solve any other function for its maximum. Simply just have to differentiate, find out what the turning point is. So when the derivative is equal to zero and solve. And so in this case, we can do that and see what number is this actually the most efficient for? 
So this is a little complicated. It's not straightforward because it's a it's a it's a function to the power of a the um the variables in it in the power as well as in the base. So with this kind of thing, you can always you generally have to do it implicitly. And first, you have to get the exponentiation out because uh, it's much easier to use product rule than it is to do some kind of funky chain rule. So I'm simply going to log both sides. Log of y is equal to so I take the log, so I bring down the, the power, right? And I simply just differentiate. So you can do this two ways. You can differentiate this implicitly and solve. Or you can notice that the log function we used on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, it's monotonic. So any turning points which exist in the original function are going to have the same value. The x value is going to be at the same position as the log of the value. So instead, I can just take this guy here. I can let this be my new y, so we can call it something like y prime, turn over x, and its turning points should exist at the exact same point as y's turning points do. So we can just differentiate this guy, and so I'll do that real quick. So we have dy star over dx, so this is just product rule now that we have taken a log function, so over x times 1 over x plus mm, derivative of n over x is negative n over x squared and I leave that, just a product rule. And I can take a n over x squared out, right? And I get one minus log of x, right? So this derivative isn't the same as the derivative of dy dx, but dy star dx has the same turning points. So when I set dy star dx equal to zero, it'll have the same turning point as dy dx, even though I don't know what that is yet. I mean, you can solve for it if you want, just implicitly differentiate this. But instead of having to do that, I'll just solve for this. And what you notice that this guy can't be equal to zero because, um, yeah, because uh, it's, a, it's a one over x squared function. So uh, it, it approaches zero in the limit that x approaches infinity or negative infinity. This is the only term, the right-hand side term, which can equal zero. So we have one minus log of x is equal to zero, which implies that log of x is equal to one, which gives you x is equal to e. So the actual function, the actual function that you're trying to solve, y equals x to the n over x, it has its maximum turning point at, as, at x equals e. And in terms of actual integer values, this is rush, roughly equal to 2.71 something, something, something. So why is 3 more efficient than 2? Well, the reason why 3 is a more efficient integer, or kind of intuitively why, I haven't, this isn't a, a real rigorous proof, but it's more of just an intuition why it potentially might be the case that increasing the base in this case from 2 to 3 is better than increasing the exponent is because the real turning point for the function that you're trying to solve for exists at e. It exists at 2.7. And 3 is kind of closer to 2.7. And this is a bit hand wavy because you don't necessarily increase. It's not a one to one increase. Like the value of the function doesn't increase by one near e. So yeah, so it's not necessarily a rigorous proof, but it kind of gives you an intuition why 3 is actually more efficient because it seems to be closer to e than 2 is, and e is the real turning point. So that's why 3 is, essentially why 3 is the most efficient integer when we use this definition of efficiency in terms of producing a greater product for a given sum.